Hello, are you out there? It's Mark with Redo Over Again. We're back to Gal Civ 4 doing the deep dive in depth tutorial episode 2. And yeah, we'll get back to it. So I'm going to try not to rush through. <laughs> I want to be thorough, but I do want to kind of cover all the main topics. So I believe we had talked about the research tab. We talked about essentially our galactic resources and our strategic resources up here at the top. We talked about our advisors and various information panels. We talked about the turn button and the idle button down here in the lower right hand corner. And we were working across the uh, the panel. These are really the gameplay windows. So we're on turn one and we're just going through the things you've got to do real quick. So I'm going to summarize. On turn one, you are going to choose your first research. And in general, that should always be colonial policies. That right there is going to unlock your policy assignments windows and yeah, give you your first uh, policy slot. So you're going to take that. It's always going to take one turn essentially. So you're going to have it really quick. Never a reason you wouldn't want to do that first. Second thing we did is we actually used an executive order to do the telescope takeover. Because it's a useful thing you could do kind of right off the bat for 15 control points. And we're seeing our control points up at the top here went from 80 to 65. We spent those. But we'll regain them at a rate of plus two per turn or per month. And with that, we were able to see this wonderful system over here to the celestial east of us. Um, there are a couple great worlds. Kratos 2 is a class 22 amazing. Kratos... Four, class 25, amazing. With some other smaller planets, but yeah, we want the system to be ours. So we could dispatch a colony ship right away. We start with the colony ship. And I, in fact, I'm going to send it to the better of the two. Now, you can check this out. We might as well look at this. I see there it's class 25. Pollution is at 40% right now. That's not great. Promethean refinery world. Interesting. That means it probably has... Promethean deposits on the surface and we can extract them and that will become one of our strategic resources we'll find up at the top. There's quite a few strategic resources in the game. Um, I think I've come across as many as a dozen at this point. I don't honestly know how many there are. I don't think it's limitless, but it's a pretty good variety. The odds are, I'm getting the feeling you're not going to have access to every strategic resource within your empire. Now, other empires will generate those strategic resources and you'll probably be able to find them eventually down here through the galactic bazaar essentially the little trade economy that exists in the game what else do we have here on kratos 4 um i see a pop cap of minus two probably due to the large amount of pollution on this planet something about this world makes it sort of toxic i guess and just looking at the amount of production here i'm going to hold the shift key so i can keep this window open and mouse that plus 13 production that gear there is pretty significant it's a boatload um the research the income the food and the influence are all it's sort of moderate levels but yeah the production is really massive um you'll also notice on this world we have a minus 50 percent to growth and the plus 30 percent to pollution so yeah that's exactly what's going on it's a highly polluted planet so you have less pop capacity and less pop growth and then finally, there's a Snuggler colony on it. Snugglers in this game, uh, and I assume from like Gal Civ 2 and 3, are essentially Tribbles. And they're adorable, and everyone in the galaxy wants them. They're, they're comfort animals. They're, co they're companions. Uh, little tiny furballs. So um, it's a strategic resource, ultimately. And we'll harvest them. You bet we will. Um, let's take a look at the other planet, though. Little less intense. It's got some pollution. It's volcanic. It's at a plus 30% pollution, though it doesn't have some of the other detriments. Now, you'll notice the production on this world is at a 5, not a 13. However, it's got significant numbers in the uh, income and food and research are all 4, 4, 4 across the board. So it's kind of a well-balanced world in that sense. All right. So we might as well send a colony ship over there. Now, we have Several things in orbit around Earth. Let's take a look at our solar system real quick. We have, I see Saturn over here. It's a dead world. We can't do anything with Saturn. We have Mercury, dead world. Can't do anything with it. Next out in orbit is Venus, dead world, devoid of life. Can't do anything with it. However, here is Mars. Mars is a class three 
poor world, desert planet, plus two production, plus two influence. It's it is even for a subpar non like a you know a per, we'll call it a production world, a world we're not going to make a core world, but we will colonize. It is even bad for for a, a, a subpar world. It's shitty. It's shitty. There we go. Okay. <laughs> And then we have some asteroid belt here. We can get an asteroid miner out there eventually. And over here we have a durantium deposit in this asteroid belt. You'll see there in the blue it says build a mining star base nearby to harvest this resource. So yeah, we can eventually make a constructor ship, send it over by that durantium. And I believe the range of the star bases to mine a deposit of any sort is up to five hexes. We can make a mining star base that'll start harvesting that durantium. Most of your strategic resources in the game are going to be harvested in segments of one tenth of a hole. So over time, your extraction methods, your research into extraction methods will increase. And that'll go from 0.1 to a 0.2 to a 0.3 to a 0.4. You can build your star bases up more and more as you gain technology. So eventually you'll be like, rapidly extracting these strategic resources. But to start with, it's a pretty slow go. So that being said, let's uh, look at our other ships in orbit here. We have a, the TSA Discovery. This is our flagship. So she has up here 50 of 50 health, medium-sized hull. So she's a big ship, essentially. Now, she's not a warship. Because we're kind of a nascent star travelers and stuff. But her move is six. Six hexes per turn. Sensor range is five hexes. Ship's max range is 27 hexes from our sphere of influence. So I don't think that means the planet Earth specifically. I think it means the border of this blue sphere of influence. That's right. We simply control this tiny little swept out area of the entire sector of the galaxy. Um, and that blue color is represents us. We chose blue when we did our customization, or I think we deal default to blue. Other species will have different colors, orange, green, all the colors of the rainbow. I don't need to name them all for you, but you get the point. When you start seeing those, those neon glowing colors coming in from, from off screen over at the side here, that means you found the edge, the border of another Xeno species sphere of influence. Okay, simple. Let's see, what else do we got? So the first thing we want to do with this flagship, the f it, this ship is a special ship called the flagship. Now, if I look here at my probe, probe is a tiny. It has a health of three. So tiny, hit three health points, hit points, as opposed to our flagship's 50. You can get an idea of the scale. It has no military capacity here. The combat rating is zero, um, and the conquest rating is zero. Can't conquer planets so essentially your combat rating is going to represent how well the ship will fight against other ships both offensive and defensive it's sort of a um composite of all the offensive and defense of the ship and the conquest rating relates to how good is it taking out a planet conquering a planet drop ships orbital bombardment all that stuff so um but yeah the probe is not a flagship now what that means is that this probe has unlimited range it can cover anywhere within our sector probably the whole galaxy eventually, but it can't explore or research these anomalies. So there are a couple of non anomalies in the soul system here. I have a capsule, a flagship can be used to examine this anomaly. And there's other types of anomalies. For instance, here is a space junk anomaly. It requires a flagship as well. So these are sort of the loot crates of the galaxy. You want to get to as many of these as you can. They do seem to respawn, though. So although you may hoover them all up eventually and other Xenos will come in trying to hoover them up, as far as I've seen, they never run out. Eventually, they'll they'll repop, respawn, and I'm not sure what that rate is. Other types, I see another one floating out here. This is another capsule. Over here is a economic relic. Interesting. We would have to build a Xeno archaeology module on a nearby star base to harvest that. Over here, we have another artifact, anomaly, requires a flagship, and another capsule. And over here is a, another anomaly, which is like a little weird squid octopus thing. So yeah, there's anomalies everywhere. 
Um, so let's start our flagship on that right off. Something important I just moused over. Anything we look at, we're going to talk about. I don't know another way to do it. This game's so complex. So I just happened to randomly mouse over this precursor anomaly. It will require a flagship to examine it. However, it's heavily defended. That means there's some sort of functional automatic d defensive system which will absolutely attack any ship we push in there. So these other anomalies we can safely approach and start investigating right away. But if we send our flagship, the Discovery, to that, whatever that is will wipe our flagship out. And when the flagship's gone, it is gone. Interesting thing about flagships, you can't not you cannot just make more of them when you want to. They're a very rare type of ship in the game. And obviously when you have two or three or four of them, you can investigate two or three or four anomalies at a time. They also form the backbone of the most powerful ships you in general have access to, at least in the earlier stages of the game. So the TS Discovery is how we're going to investigate anomalies, but it's also our most potent weapon. You can see she is flying with a composite value of 7 for her combat rating. That's coming down to a beam attack of a 2. Particle beam is a plus 2 on top of that, as well as a missile attack base 3, which is, I, I take that back, sorry, the total beam attack is comprised, is two comprised of a single particle beam that gives it a plus two. The total missile attack here is a three, which is comprised of an Avenger missile giving it a plus three. As we discover new technologies, we'll, we will be able to add more beam and missile attacks and armor and shields and all sorts of components to this ship as it levels up. You'll notice down here that she has an experience bar, zero of eight. As she researches anomalies and does other things, fights, wars, you know, combats, she will gain experience. And every level we can add a module to her, increasing her missiles or increasing her beams or increasing her shields, scanners, movement rate, hit points. That's how we're going to build it up. So you kind of think of um, your ships are like your heroes. You're going to level your ships. You're going to kit them out and build them up, uh, much like you would a World of Warcraft character. Yeah, they are they are the true heroes of, of, of your game, of your playthrough, functionally. Okay? So let's just take our first flagship, and we'll send her to the nearest by. We have a capsule. We have space junk. So space junks, these can be floatsome and jetsome of the galaxy. They're rarely of great value, but provide unique opportunities. That is space junk. Over here, we have the capsule. Capsules are lost goods, never recovered, escape pods, jettison, contraband, or simply misplaced wares. They have miscellaneous effects. So you can kind of get a feel for what type of anomaly you're going to investigate and what you might get out of it. So let's go for the space junk. Maybe it'll just be some, some treasure, credits, I don't know. Could be anything. So we'll just select the ship and we'll just uh, right click. And remember, our ship has a movement of six. She used three of six to fly over there. And she will begin the anomaly investigation. Now, you'll notice visually, you see scanner beams coming from your flagships investigating the anomaly pile. It is important to note that down here, the Discovery is now surveying and has four months remaining before the survey is complete. So she'll be busy doing that for a little bit. Now, in the early game in general, you're pretty safe. Uh, no one's going to jump on you and wipe your ships out early on. The only example, uh, the only thing that would contradict that statement would be, again, if we were to go investigate that heavily defended precursor, we could fly our ship right over and it would be destroyed on, like, turn three. It would just be game over, ships destroyed. So, <laughs> let's look at our other ships. We have the probe next. I'll select the probe. Up here on top, we have the Thea. She's idling, but she has a few things she can do. Pass a turn, meaning just skip. By skipping, it allows us to get this turn next, the next turn generated, and then she'll reawaken and say, hey, I was idle, give me a command. And you can pass a turn if you need to. I don't really do that too much. We have a go-to, so you can just right-click to send her to a specific spot. I can just right-click out here in the galaxy, and she'll start going. I can have her sleep or stand by. This is handy if you just want to have... a say a military ship camp a good object or planet and you're like yeah if someone comes by 
I'll vaporize them. If the colony ship comes in on the sweet ass planet, that's not my colony ship. I'm going to destroy it. Uh, my colony ship's coming, but it's going to be like it's eight months out. I can't risk someone else getting it. So you could have a, a ship stand by. But more importantly, you could have it sentry. Sentry is going to put the ship to sleep, but it will reactivate as soon as an enemy ship comes within sensor range. So that's really how you would protect a planet. I don't honestly know why you would use standby at all. It remains inactive and unresponsive until told otherwise. I, I would always use sentry, but it's the same feature, except it'll wake up and let you know something's going on. So, and then finally, in particular for a probe, the probe has the explorer feature, will attempt to clear the fog of war. Now you could direct your probe every turn, but really you don't have time. As, as the player, you don't have time to manage three, four, 10 probes, you just eat up the clock. So we're just gonna hit explore. It is auto. Look at, there's her route. She is going to over several turns. There's an, two turns, three turns, four turns, five turns, six turns. She's gonna jaunt essentially all the way across the sector cutting right through the middle, opening it up. She doesn't know what's out there. Her erratic pattern is probably some sort of um, random path, you know, tree that's developed. Um, there's no real logic to it. I think it's just sort of jigging and jagging to make it interesting, but it doesn't know what's out there. So how could it? All right. That being said, the probe is good to go. Bon voyage. We don't need to worry about it. The probe will continue. The probe will run for hours of play just doing whatever it does it will never discover an anomaly and it will never engage with anything else outside of getting destroyed if that probe were to wander too close to something like this heavily defended precursor anomaly the anomaly would destroy the probe so that's the, probably the one small drawback to your probes being completely automated is they aren't too smart be careful i will warn you right now that if we wanted to send something like our sweet ass colony ship the endeavor here to a star way over here and i right clicked the endeavor would start going towards this star and as she passed this red heavily defended precursor anomaly it would destroy the colony ship absolutely the auto pathing of your ships can take them into danger and get them destroyed be careful because it will piss you off when it happens but it can happen Ugh. okay so <laughs> I wouldn't use your colony ships and your flagships to explore uncharted areas, though. just between you and I. It's not the right thing to do with them. However, we do have a colony ship ready to go. The Endeavor's ready to fly. You can see she's not too tough with 5 HP. She has no offensive weapons or anything else. Um, she's got a moderate range, moderate speed. But yeah, let's send her out. So we're going to click her and send her. Um, I haven't talked about logistics yet. Logistics is the ability to combine ships into a single fleet, which is maxed out by the logistics cap. So we're going to look at a couple things. I'm going to hold the shift key so I can show you that the Endeavor uses up four total logistics points. She can be combined with a fleet of up to 10 logistics points. That just happens to be the cap at our level of technology for our civilization right now. So she could be in there with our flagship, has a logistics point of six. So it, the biggest fleet we could make would be our flagship with one colony ship, six logistics, four logistics for a max of 10. That cap will increase as we develop technologies and find other cool stuff. So you can make bigger and bigger fleets. But for right now, you don't really need to worry about fleets. Making a fleet is actually quite easy. You can literally just... I could send the colony ship and right click on the discovery. And when the two ships enter the same hex, they will functionally form a fleet. So it's super easy to group them. And then you can break them apart with one of these tiles and separate them out and manage them and all that. So you can have different fleets within the same hex and you'll get an up and down arrow bar right here. And you can cycle through the different fleets in a given hex. So you can have three or four ships going in different directions overlapping it won't combine them into a single fleet necessarily. But yeah, if, if I were to just to grab the Endeavor and then just right click on the Discovery, I believe it would combine them into a fleet automatically. But in general, I don't find the fleet hand um, management too difficult. So at any rate, we know where we want the Endeavor to go. We've already found a great system and a great planet via the 
telescope. <laughs> telescope. Telescope. You know, we always telescope things, folks, around here. Telescope takeover. We have a 30-turn a 30 turn cooldown on that, so it'll be a long while till we can use the telescope again, but for now, we got it. So, um, our ship is highlighted. Let me click off there. There we go. Highlighting the ship, and I will just left-click and scoot over. I will zoom in. We've got these sweet-ass worlds, and uh, yeah, we're going to right-click right there on Kratos. And you can see it'll be just beyond four turns for the Endeavor. You see that hex there, the number four. There's the number three. So yeah, we'll we'll have a new colony there in, in no time. It'll be awesome. It's going to be great. We can mine these asteroids. We can colonize these lesser worlds. And uh, it's going to be pretty cool. Now, for the time being, that's our entire Space Navy has been assigned to task. No problem. So the last thing that's probably of interest before we look at our world. Remember, we haven't finished the first turn yet here, folks. We're still on turn one. Hope you're having fun. <laughs> Let's look at our space station, the Forge. Each uh, civilization has a different term for their their main space station, but you can make one of these around every core world colony. So we'll have another one of these eventually. You have to build them. It takes a little bit of time, but yeah, you can have uh, a dozen uh, space docks, okay? But yeah, you can see it's a shipyard is what they call it. Has a hundred health. A little bit of offense, defense over here. So they are they can be attacked, but they can be destroyed. They're not super survivable, but they're not wilting daisies. I'll tell you, the other star bases you can make, mining star bases, communication star bases, and military star bases can be beefed up, all of them, with better weapons, better armor, better scanners. They can be made pretty durable like you know kind of like a a, a true uh, orbital fortress the shipyard though can't so it is a little delicate because you don't want those things to be destroyed you can make another one on the planet you'd go to the local planet you'd say click on build me another star dock and it would over the course of so many turns would build you another one but if you're conducting a war against a xeno or they against you you go for those star docks you take them out and it limits their ship production really really easily you so far that i've seen cannot make a ship on a planetary surface you could from a planetary surface make a star a space shipyard uh, sorry star dock shipyard and once that's done you can then go into the shipyard and build a ship but it that could be 20 turns later before you get that next ship out so protect your shipyards if you see xenos sniffing around fortunately it's super easy to protect a planet a shipyard, or a space station. You simply would take a ship, such as the Discovery, you'd select her, and then you would just right-click onto the forge, and the Discovery will just go park itself inside the forge. You'll get a little green shield icon floating here, indicating that there are ships in there reinforcing the shipyard. It's that easy to d defend together. Now, bear in mind, when I click on the forge you'll notice down uh over here in the lower left hand corner her information came up and she has a logistics value of zero of 60. that's right uh, although our individual ship fleets are limited to 10 logistics command points logistical points the forge can handle up to 60 so you can put a beefy space navy in there to protect her from being destroyed it's pretty sweet um, we'll click on Earth real quickly. Earth can have, I believe, an unlimited size Space Navy. I could defend Earth, however, by also selecting the Discovery and simply right-clicking on Earth. She would kind of disappear into Earth, and a little green and white shield would appear there to show that colony is being defended by ships. And actually, underneath, uh, in this little blank area right down here, is where you'd see the various ships that are in there. Same with the shipyard. So it's easy to see what ships are there. You can extract them. You can manage the fleets, send them out, or eject them, spit them out, all that kind of cool stuff. So yeah, it's pretty sweet. But let's take a look at the forge here while we've got her up. And up at the top, we can design ships. I have never designed a single ship. I haven't even looked at the designer. I've been playing the game off and on for a month now. But we'll learn it. We'll get into it. We can set a rally point. 
this is a little bit handy. Obviously, you have six hexes around this hex, and you can just click and just set the rally point. Do you want her to be here, 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 wherever, rally point, anywhere? Um, I would say set a rally point between new rally point right here between the two worlds. Um, I, I think it gives you a little bit of a better defensive bubble. You know, if Zeno, say, came in over here from the Celestial West, you wouldn't want your rally point spitting your ships out into this asteroid belt while some enemy Xenos just take them out one after another. Putting them here maybe makes them a little more protected between the planet and the station. You could make a military outpost floating in orbit out here and potentially cough them right into the vicinity of that military outpost, which will kind of like you can automatically shoot from the outpost at stuff. So at any rate, I haven't messed with the rally point too much, but yeah, there you go. We got a rally point one. What else do we have? Construct ships. Yeah. Manage that. I think it'd be manage fleets potentially, but um, otherwise she has a total attack value of nine. Cool. Her military. This is interesting. <laughs> Mili military, which is this cool little reddish icon with a little ship, represents how much production this star base can harvest from her sponsor world, which is Earth. And as I look at it, it's really hard to see this, but check this out. I'm going to rotate. I'm going to rotate view right there. I'll get above. Do you see this pulsing white line coming out of Earth to the forge? Anytime you see that line, there's there's the, there's the orbital line, which is just a fixed ring, right? That's the orbit of the planet. But this pulse that's coming out of Earth, and you can see it moving slowly, that means that resources from Earth are going into the forge. Interestingly, 3.9 is a little bit less than the four production Earth has. And actually, you see it's a 3.9 production. So what that means is, is we build up Earth, and Earth's production climbs from 3.9 to 5 to 15 to 55. The military output of the forge will climb roughly in, in step with that. Now, I've noticed the further your colonies shipyard colonies and shipyards are from earth you get more and more drop off of that number and i haven't been able to exactly crack that nut of why that occurs but it does so you may have a colony halfway across the sector with its own shipyard and that colony produces 20 or whatever but it doesn't eh, i don't know we'll have to look at the numbers as we play forward but i've noticed that it, it's definitely a mystery to me why that occurs but yeah uh Rather than calling it production, they just call it military. You you can build a, at a military of 3.9, but it's going to grow roughly with Earth's production. I don't know why it's called military. A military, what, what you harvest for your military to fabricate, I guess that's what they're alluding to. What else do we have here? Um, ships, no ships in the queue. De total defense is zero. So she has a little bit of offense, no defense of any sort. 100 hit points and the logistics, obviously. The shipyard is currently idle. And uh, so yeah, let's just uh, let's just click into here. I just double clicked on it. So up here, you can see the forges sponsor is Earth. So far as I know, each shipyard can only have a single sponsor. I have not found a way to have multiple worlds sponsoring a shipyard. I don't know why, but you know, maybe there's something we'll figure out. But uh, for the time being, we have a we can. Look at a ship. Here's a sweet ass ship. It's pretty cool. Can I can kind of move it around? Oh yeah, you can see that it's it's within the shipyard there. Can I hold down my yeah my mouse button? Uh, my wheel. Sorry, mouse wheel. And can I zoom in? Yeah, you can get in there pretty good. So yeah, it's fun. You know, you can really inspect the ship. But ultimately, these are our available projects. We have ships. We have a few missions. Missions um, are essentially sort of odd ways to repurpose the production that's going on at our shipyard to do other stuff. For instance, a treasure hunt would cost minus 300, meaning it costs 300 hammers, productions, and it would allow us to subsidize a private venture to unknown places to find and collect valuable artifacts. 
cool. I, I guess it's like, uh, I think it allows you to like maybe go click on an anomaly and research it without a flagship, I guess. I only point out, I, I, I've done it once and I couldn't really figure out what the hell happened to be really honest because the minus 300, 300 production is massive. It, it's a really big number. We're only producing 3.9. <laughs> so I'm not going to jump down the treasure hunt trail anytime soon. Uh, there's also a research mission. This would essentially generate research by having your shipyard study the surrounding area. Essentially, you're just going to take your shipyard production and generate research with it. Yeah, but it would cost 200 production and one Promethean to generate one research mission. So again, not something I would necessarily recommend. It's an extremely inefficient way to use your shipyard, to, to be just blunt about it. It is not what the shipyard is meant to do. The shipyard is meant to make the ship. So <laughs> up here, we can see that the colony ship we can just generate another one and down right, eh, shift click, shift, shift and hold. There we go. 40 production. So I only say that like building an entire colony ship takes 40 production. Whereas these crazy missions cost 200 and 300 is a, is a scale factor for you. Um, we could use more colony ships. Yeah, absolutely. We can make a constructor. Constructor is the base ship to make a star base. The ship will fly out to wherever you want the star base to be. When it gets there, you essentially click on the constructor ship and you say convert to a star base and you, you got a star base that easy. It only costs 100 construction points, so it's not cheap. It'll take a little bit to build that sucker up. 26 turns. Yeah, that's no joke. Um, and you can see that right here. The colony ship takes 11 turns. You see right where my mouse is. 26 turns for the constructor. Supply ship, 17 turns. Supply ship is an interesting one. Essentially, it hauls refined goods to another colony, providing 100 manufacturing points, 100 hammers. Look, we already know that Earth, our main world, is only generating, we'll say, four hammers. You build this up, not a bad way to do things. For 65 production, you get 100 production. It's actually not a bad deal. <laughs> You're getting free production. As far as I can do the math, that's 35 extra production, roughly a 50% bonus. So to me, that seems like a very efficient way to make production, potentially. And what I would recommend doing is making a supply ship in whatever planet, your colony of yours, that you drive that supply ship into, it just takes the 100 production and dumps it into the production queue. You can actually produce multiple buildings it'll it'll produce whatever dump the hundred in and any surplus will just go to the next item in the production queue on a colony so i've actually seen two things in the queue disappear be instantly made and another one get halfway produced with that to give you an idea of scale so it's not bad at all and um i think we might experiment we could potentially make a supply ship and drive it into earth and see if we can stimulate Earth's production with it, her own supply ship, I, I, I guess. It definitely works with other colonies. So I could see generating a supply ship, chasing it right after the uh, colony ship we've just sent off. And the colony ship will arrive at the planet, make a colony, and a couple turns later, the supply ship lands at the colony. And you can jumpstart production really quick, which is important, especially if you're only making three or four or five production a turn, a hundred is a great head start. And if you ever have idle time on, you know, when, when you get further in the game, you're going to have four, five, six uh, shipyards. Have a couple of them making supply ships around the clock. Yeah. Maybe one's making colony ships. Maybe one's making warships. One's making starbase modules, which is uh, the, the strategic resource we, we generate and consume. Yeah, you can make them on a, on a shipyard. And, uh, and one's making supply ships. So you, you, you can have your different star bases doing different cool shit. But ultimately, you won't build anything until you hit the build ship button. So right now, it's we're, we've selected colony ship. We could select constructor. So there's the cool ship. And do we want to build it? If we hit build, it'll pop it in the queue. We can put multiple ships into the queue. We can mix and match. 
There's a colony ship. So there we go. Constructor, 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 colony ship. We can drag and relocate, re-optimize however we want. And we can easily, by clicking on a ship, we can continue making the design until further notice, meaning put it on repeat. The little recycle arrows is repeat build. We can rush it by using our credits, our Galacto credits, our money to insta buy it. We'll get into that in just a moment. But first, let's delete a few of these. We're just going to delete that constructor. We don't want to make that one. Let's delete that colony ship. Let's delete this other constructor and this one. All right. Yeah, I don't want to build out my queue for like 100 turns in advance. So let's say we want that constructor. We want to go make a star base sooner rather than later. Sure. I don't know. Um, but we could rush construction. Now, to rush a construction takes two things. It takes credits and it takes control. Now, control is what we use to do our telescope, you know, spying thing. We used 15. Most of the rushes, most rush builds that I've seen take a single control point. So your control goes pretty far. You can stretch it. You always want to have a few control points because you may need to rush a spaceship. You can also rush builds on buildings on your planetary surface, and it takes a point or two. You can also use um, control points to train population, your pops, for specialty training. Hey, you're a farmer. You're a producer, factory worker. You're a entertainer. You're a researcher, scientist. So things like that. But um, those control points go pretty far. You never want to have none, but in general... There's only so many needs that I've found for them so far. But um, yeah, what do we want to build? Constructor, colony ship. I want more colony ships sooner rather than later. So I'm actually going to put the colony ship build and I'll swap those two. There we go. 11 turns, 26 turns. We'll hit done. So you can see here now that she is building on a colony ship in 11 turns here at the forge. Whew. Man, there's a lot to talk about, folks. <laughs> Now, at this point, you can see that we've gotten the advanced turn arrow. We have taken care of all the idle things. There's still one thing we haven't done. We can do work on Earth. We haven't even looked at Earth. That's a whole nother layer here to this. So let's jump into Earth, see what we can do. Um, bear in mind, we could, with our 1,500 credits up top, uh, that's the average you start with. I don't think we did. We took any special modifiers. You can start with bonuses to that through your your civilization abilities and shit like that. You can get big bonuses to it. But 1500 is pretty good. You'll use that up fast. You'll notice right now we only get a plus two credit surplus per turn. So it's... You no, know, you could beef that up. I had a civilization where I was getting, you know, plus 60, plus 70 credits a turn. You know, I, I had to lean into that. But yeah, you can get a lot of production on that. But when it takes 750 to rush build that colony ship or whatever it is, 750, 1,000, whatever, it's expensive. You'll burn through that piggy bank really fast. So be cautious. Now, we're at the early stages of the game. It might be tempting to just jumpstart jump start production. So we could burn through our piggy bank right now. We could do that. Let's look at a couple other things before we get into that, though. One other executive order that's available, FYI, draft colonists for 33 control points with a 12-turn cooldown. Sometimes we can't afford to wait for volunteers. This will provide a free colony ship. The side effect, minus two to approval. I believe, I, I don't know if that's a permanent minus two to approval. I don't think it is, but this is one of those things where Stardock's not really telling us. Uh, I don't like that so much. Let me point out real quickly that if we go over to print money, this other e executive action here, it tells us that the minus 10 to approval, morale approval, lasts for approximately a year. Okay, so I know how long that minus 10% detriment is going to last around the year. 10, 12 turns, I don't know, somewhere in that range. But it doesn't tell me when I draft colonists. So is a, a player like me, I'm going, well, I don't really know what the fudge it does. Because someone at Stardock forgot to 
type in the freaking extra three words? I don't know. Come on, guys. Come on. Like, this ain't that hard, Stardock. Like, it, it's a legitimate question. It's like, do I think it's a permanent minus 2% to my approval forever? I don't think so. But is it? I <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> it's just... It's ain't rocket science. Um, I'm going to assume it is because they don't tell me otherwise. So am I going to spend 33 control to get a free colony ship right now and jumpstart my whole game? No, because I don't want to suffer a 2% approval. 2% approval is going to be like, like, presumably across all of your colonies. So at some point in the game, we might have 20 colonies and they're all suffering a minus two to their approval, which is going to affect other productions. It's never going to be worth a free colony ship. So, me bitching, but again, I'm not the one doing sloppy, making a sloppy game. So, yeah. Um, hey, I, I'm, I, I like the game, but I'm going to call out Stardock where I see slop. In that slop. You know, you, you're making a game with 100 icons and hundreds of hours of play and replayability, but you're just going to be like, you guys will have to figure it out. Just pay attention every single turn for the next 50 turns and see if the 2% goes away. It's like, it, it, is that my job? Come on. All right. So I'll let, I'll let it go with that. But that's another way to get a colony ship. I, I'm The reason I'm on this talking about it for minutes is because we can just build a colony ship. We can buy a colony ship outright with our credits, or we can use the executive orders to draft colonists and get a free colony ship. There's a lot of ways to do the same things, and it's going to come down to your play style. Whew. All right. <laughs> Let's jump into the planet here, folks. Yeah. You can see all sorts of stuff here. It's terrestrial world. Approval rating sitting at 54%. Nanite transmitter artifact. Aurorus Arboretum. Civilization capital. It's pretty sweet. It's a great world. Yeah, let's jump in here. Boom. Welcome to the planet. Yeah. Okay, here we are. So much to go over, folks. Okay, let's do the same breakdown. Now, up at the top, we have our galaxy-wide numbers. That hasn't changed. And our strategic resources will always be up here. And our prestige victory will always be up here. But let's start with the simple stuff. Up here in the upper right corner will be your shipyard. You can see right now she is making a colony ship at 11 turns. This uh, blue circle within a circle, you'll notice there's no tooltip. What, what, what is that? Well, via experimentation, I was able to figure out that it shows you how many ships are in the queue. So if you have three ships in the queue, this will show three. I don't know why they chose that icon, and I don't know why it doesn't have a tooltip. But, hey, Stardock, fix it. <laughs> This would be her defensive value, essentially. Uh, this would represent actually ships defending her. Thinnest ships that we've assigned to defend her within her 60 logistics bubble. Uh, there's none right now. We're not protecting her at all. We'll want to remedy that at some point in the future. We will. And here, of course, is her military. Again, no tooltip, but we've already seen that that symbol means military. And that 3.9 is going to roughly correspond with the 3.9 manufacturing on the world. Now, we're at 43 minutes into this video. We're gonna spend the rest of the video looking at the, at the the world here, the colony page and going through it. This probably deserves its own hour long video, but we probably do a pretty good justice over the next 30 minutes. But yeah, when we wrap looking at this, that'll be the end of, of this tutorial video. And even at that point, we will not have advanced a single turn yet. So. This tutorial is an in-depth one. It's meant to be crunchy and look at the numbers. If anyone out there appreciates this level of depth, let me know legitimately. I don't mind talking about it because for me, it reinforces it in my own mind. So it's a good exercise for, for me to do regardless, but I wanna know if, if anyone out there is appreciating it and would like more, more depth, more crunchy. Okay. Let's keep going. So below that are some improvements. These are the buildings we can build. All right, right now, there's only a few we have access to. As we research, we will get dozens of these things. You can see the number down here is how many turns it will take to build it. The simple math is pretty simple. Let's take a look at this little research one, this blue one here. Six turns. 
Why is it six turns? Its construction cost is a minus 20, meaning it takes 20 hammers. <laughs> Our production is 3.9. You divide 3.9 into 20. It comes out to be just positive of five turns. Obviously, four times five would be 20, but we don't quite get to 20. Therefore, it rolls around to the sixth turn. That's where the six comes from. Simple math, but I want you guys to understand that uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily seem quite obvious because a lot of times we're dealing with decimal places over here, over here, but that's where those numbers come from. Now, of the buildings, the most important one that you're going to want to build the first time you get any colony is this capital. Its construction cost is zero, meaning you just simply get to take the building and drop it under one of these hexes, and it's just there. Never delay. On the first turn of your game, before you advance to turn two, make sure you put this capital building down. It will give you benefits right away. And in fact, you can lose population. If you look over here, we have seven pops with a capacity for three. That's a big problem. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we want to drop the capital. It'll fix that right away. But also anytime... Oh, a new colony ship hits a colony, you're going to have ability to put up the planetary capital down right away, jump right to that planet, drop the planetary capital. We'll get into what that's going to mean. There's so much to do. Down at the bottom, FYI, there are available projects. These are essentially similar to our shipyard up above where you could do sort of like have your shipyard do research. And you're like, really? Is, this, is that really what it's best at? It's like, eh. You really want to focus down. Listen, we can make buildings that do research. We can have civilians that are trained to be scientists. We can have our shipyard doing research projects and we can have available projects down here such as do more research. So it allows you to micromanage your entire galactic empire. And if you wanted to do research, you could say you research, you research, you, 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 you. And you could hit it in a dozen places. That is one of the really great and charming and fun things about this game is that there are many ways to get it what you want. We talked about three ways to get the colony ship right off the bat. And we're looking at multiple ways to get extra research generated right off the bat. And, and this one in particular is um, economic stimulus. Check it out. We dump 250 hammers production into this economic stimulus project and it'll spit out. 100 credits to our treasury. I don't know why it says treasury, not credits, but this is, again, one of these, like, silly things. But, yeah, it just means treasury. It's 100 credits. I don't know why it doesn't say 100 credits. It says 100 treasury. Ah, whatever the fudge. But you get it. That means this number up here will go up to 1,600. Cool. We'll gain ways to do other projects. It'll take technologies to gain access to those projects. Research, 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 research. It's going to open up everything else you can do in the game. It really blooms and blossoms out. It's pretty sweet. Um, so, yeah, we have a build queue down here. And the build queue will just pop out all manner of stuff. Now, right now, we are working on a Colonial Leadership Council. We didn't put that there. It defaults on turn zero with that in there, you'll notice the production, the construction cost is minus three. So you have it in one turn. Do we want it? You bet we do. It's going to unlock the civilization achievement screen, which back on our, our main galaxy screen, one of the ones down at the bottom is grayed out. So we get that right away next turn. So we're going to make it. You're always going to want to build this first. Don't do anything else without building this first. So it'll also uh, give us a plus two to our population cap over here. So this number will go from three to five just by having that. Pretty sweet. So yeah, we'll leave that in there. Um, let's keep going. We're not going to hit done. Let's look at our hex tiles. Let's do that next. There are all manner of hexes. It's worth investigating all of them. So we have some kind of vaguely general type planes. Nice flat land ready for improvement. You can build more or less anything here. We've got some desert. Food improvements cannot be constructed here, but any other type of improvement could be. So, you know, a little less useful than a prairie. What else do we have that's kind of basic? What are the basic bitches we got here? Eh, not too many. So that's it. We got plains, deserts. Those are our basics. Now, 
we have some little white symbols. These are the next most exciting. So no icon means very boring. A little white icon means eh, sort of so-so. And then you get like cooler things like these colorful icons, which are even sweeter bonuses. And we got these crazy ones. These are super special things that are unique to your world. And they're kind of randomly generated as you find worlds. They might give you a strategic resource or some other special ability. You're not going to get any other way in the game. So let's start at the most basic though, because we want to build from less cool to more cool. So let's just look through here. The white little, uh, I, I think to me that's a pagoda or building, that is influence. If we build influence-based structures on that tile, it'll give us a plus one to that uh, structure's output, okay? Now, bear in mind the word plus one to influence matters because only an influence building will benefit being built there. We'll get into it. For instance, let's jump up to our capital building right here at the top, population improvement. The capital city building is a population building. It actually has a type. So we would want to go to a tile on our world somewhere that gives us a bonus to population, such as right here. This plus one will apply to that capital building structure if we build the capital building on it. We actually have an even better tile, which I'm kind of excited about. We'll get to it in a moment. Let's go to our other buildings real quick though. Here we have the capital mainframe up here. It's a research improvement. That means this type of building, I'm telling you guys this, it may be obvious to you, but it was not obvious to me right away how subtle that little subcategory is. We want to build this research improvement building on a research tile. Like that plus three to research would synergize very nicely with that building. And finally over here, we have a industrial center. It is a manufacturing improvement type. We want to build that on a manufacturing improvement. So really be cautious about your, you only get a handful of buildings over here. There's not an infinite number of them, but as you're getting them and you're dropping them into your world, they're giving you big bonuses, but make sure you build them in the right spot. I just wanted to point that out. We'll look back and I, I know these buildings have all these really cool things. We're going to get into all this. <laughs> this might be a two hour video. Obviously, if anyone's bored, they've already clicked off. We're fucking 52 minutes into this thing, but let's keep going. I, I find it so fascinating. And this really what I love about the game is just digging into this shit. So let's keep going. It's late at night and I'm swearing. I don't have a drink. I should have had a bevy. Next time, next time, folks, I'm going to have a little beverage, a little mix up, a little triple sec. Yeah. With some vitamin C drink. So it's healthy, though. That's the trick. Big brain. OK, let's keep going. <laughs> We've got the little gem is a plus one to wealth. Uh, that's going to essentially translate to Galacto credits up here. Credits. Um, we have the gear is a plus one to manufacturing. We have a light bulb plus one to research. It's probably pretty obvious to you. There aren't that many other kinds. We have the house, which is a plus one to population. Pretty sweet. And uh, yeah, that's kind of it. The other one I've seen is a, a leaf. And the leaf can usually means food, but I've also seen it mean production, like a, a jungle. A jungle is opposed to being a good place to make food. They're saying, no, no, like rubber trees. There's so much natural plant and animal material in the jungle. It gives you a plus one to production. So it is oftentimes worth scanning over every icon on a new world to make sure that it doesn't relate to other stuff. So I let's let's just look through here. Influence, wealth, 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 uh, influence, research, research. Research. I've never seen a light bulb not mean research, FYI. Manufacturing, the gears always mean manufacturing. The house means population, in this case, research, manufacturing, influence, manufacturing, manufacturing. And you're going, gee, that seemed like that was really a waste of time. It, it, and I kind of agree, except that I have seen the leaf mean food, and I've seen the leaf mean manufacturing. Uh, it's like... Give us another icon, Stardock. Just give us another icon. Don't don't conflate two different things. We'll find a world, and I will show you guys this. I am not crazy. I, I will show you. And you're just going like, yeah, just make another fucking icon here. So, sorry. I'm going to swear more the later it gets here. 
it's late at night and I'm, yeah, I'm just in it now. I'm in it. Let's keep going. Let's get to the better icons. There's better, sweeter, more advanced icons. Let's start here with the mushrooms. These freakishly large mushrooms represent a generous food source plus three to food production. Now we don't have a farming building over here now, but we'll get one. All right, here we go. We have some yellow bubblies. Fields rich with precious gold will enrich whoever mines it, plus three to wealth. So this yellow gold icon represents essentially three of these gem icons. It's functionally what that means. It, there, there's nothing else to it. It's just, it, it is what it is. It's just three times better. It's a nice one. What else do we got? We have uh, this cool crystal lattice thing up here. This reef, oh, it's a reef, interesting, is home of many exotic creatures we can study. It's plus three to research. So it's the equivalent of three light bulbs all in one. And we have another one here. Check this one out. This one is a combo. This is the Aurorus Arboretum. Now, these special tiles you can see when you mouse over a world from orbit. One you haven't even colonized yet. When we look at that planet we sent our colony ship to, it has like one of these on it or something. So you can see these very special tiles even without being able to zoom into the world, you can you can see them. So it's kind of cool. While we're talking about this, let's take one second. Let's jump out. Let's zoom out. Let's go over to this world. We mouse over it and it has the Snuggler colony. Can I double click on the world without a double click? No. So I can't actually zoom into the world and see the hexes, but I know it, one of the tiles will be a snuggler colony, so FYI. And what, what did the other world have up here, uh, this one? Uh, nothing, this is volcanic. So it'll have some lavas and some cool shit like that. Okay, let's jump back into Earth here, folks. Jump back into Earth, where we left off. Boom, here we are, we're back home. So this one's pretty cool though. Yeah, so this is a combo. It can either, if you build a tourism structure, it'll give you a plus two to a tourism building, or it'll give you a plus one to level with an approval building, I I guess. is Are there approval buildings? Shit. I think so. Anyway, it's a trade resource. These staggeringly beautiful bioluminescent trees stand nearly a kilometer high. Ooh, so cool. That's on Earth? Yeah, it is now. Fuck it. <laughs> and are considered one of the natural wonders of the galaxy. Very, very cool. I'm loving that. Actually, I'm realizing something. This is subtly different. This is an adjacency level bonus for either tourism structures or approval structures. And there are approval structures. There's like hollow theaters and shit like that you can build to, to increase the uh, approval of your planet. So like a, a plus one there is going to equate to essentially a plus 1% to your approval, happiness, morale on this world. So yeah, that exists. So adjacency bonus means that building around this tile here in the desert, you can get that bonus to tourism or approval. Or if you build here in this forest, you could get a bonus to an, a tourism or approval building. And down here in the Fertile Valley, you could also do that. Uh, so that's an interesting one. Let's look at the up arrow. Essentially, this cool giant tree just exists right now. What is it doing for us? Eh, not that much, but we can improve it. The up arrow here, if I mouse up to the top where that little orange arrow is, it's saying, do you want to make an Aurorus, Aurorus Orchard? It would cost 30 production, but what it would yield, its base effect, meaning its instantaneous effect upon completion will yield plus one to maintenance. Oh, right on. No, that means plus one credit and tax every single turn as long as the building exists. It's actually a burden. So <laughs> that little wrench is your enemy. <laughs> it means that it's something you got to pay for all the time. So it's not actually that great, but it's important to keep track. And more expensive buildings can cost two or three maintenance a turn or, or more potentially. So watch that. Watch it. It's probably well worth it because what it will do is it will generate one-tenth of an Aurorus or Bor... Uh, oh, oh, how the fuck do you say that? Arboretum. There you go. <laughs> Aurorus Arboretum per turn. And it will become a strategic resource. One of the very rare ones. Most of the other Xenos out there might not have this. Of the six other species, 
they're not all going to have access to this. Maybe one or two, but we will have it. So we can start banking that that precious resource as quick as we could make that. No, a, a minus 90 would take a while to make, but yeah, we could do it. And it, another base effect, will, it'll, it'll offer this whole world a plus 10% bonus to tourism. I'm not exactly 100% sure what tourism does. Let's see if we can shift. I'm going to hold the shift key, and mouse over. Tourism increases how much income you gain based on how large your zone of control is. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Zone of control, folks, if we jump out, this blue, our, our little blue neon area, that's our zone of control. Well, your zone of control eventually will extend all this and is eventually could extend the, to the entire sector if you conquer the whole thing. That's how big your zone of control is. So it's saying tourism is somehow loosely or tightly connected to how big your zone of control is. So I'm not exactly sure how the math would work out. Obviously, that's a hard thing to estimate because you're you're looking at a, ge a geographical area of your share of the galaxy, and it'll be multiplied by something else. Don't worry about tourism yet. It's more it's some you'll get tourism structures kind of later into the early game here. So it doesn't really matter yet. Um, but yeah, and then one other thing, the adjacency bonuses will still apply. So much like currently, the the, the, the the forest as it exists now already gives you an adjacency bonus of plus two and a plus one. But if we were to do the upgrade, it would stay the same. That matters because some other special structures you might uh, improve might make that adjacency bonus go up. It might be a two to production, but then when you do the improvement, it becomes a three to adjacent tile production. So you can really get some pretty cool stuff, but make sure you keep an eye out for it. There's no point to rush to that Aurora's Orchard, though. We'll leave it sitting for the time being. We have the Fertile Valley. This is a sweet one. Nested between mountains, these lush valleys boost rich, boast rich soil. Now, there's a tricky MF here because this little pine tree green hexagon, I have seen it, I swear, I have seen that same icon used for plus three population, housing, uh, population. So this is another one of those weird ones where I swear I've seen the same icon mean two separate things. So this is why you always mouse over every hex in your newly colonized world. They won't change later. Like once you've looked at them, they are what they are. But I have seen both the green leaves, which aren't on here, represent manufacturing and food. And I've seen this F and green tree here represent plus three food or plus three population. Well, let me see. If you ever see that green tree as plus three population, you take your capital building, your capital city, and you immediately dump it onto that tile. Because this capital building is a population improvement. Now, let's break this down a little bit. Where are we going to put our, our population? Okay. Pause. We have one more tile to look at, then we're going to go back to our capital building. We'll decide where we're going to drop it, and we're going to talk about how and what that does. So here's our last tile we have to look at. A nanite transmitter. It's an artifact improvement. Upgrade this artifact to unlock charges that will create a warship. Fucking awesome. Free warship. Good warship. I like that. This is an interesting one, though. This one isn't going to produce a... Um, a strategic resource in, in in tenths of a strategic resource over many months. It will give us a charge. I'm going to back out of the earth menu again here. Uh, charges will exist right here. It'll, it'll essentially show up as an artifact. We don't have any artifacts yet, but it's a very simple menu that will give us these little medallions, these little symbols that will just appear across here when we, we open this window. One of them would be a, a, a medallion that'll essentially say, yeah, click me and you'll get a nanite warship because you 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 made one from your nanite thing here on Earth. Yeah. And as you discover, you open up anomalies, space junk, other anomalies, you research them over here, capsules, you'll find these other medallions, these artifacts that you can bank 
You can save up. Some of them can stack. You can find multitudes of certain types. And they can do anything from, say, permanently reduce the pollution on a planet to summon a space monster, to assemble a warship, to... Uh, I don't know. All sorts of stuff. It's it's really fun. It's really... Um, it's like slot machine style. Like, it's a gamble. It's, it's a very soft sci-fi part of the game you know when we're looking at numbers and we're multiplying 3.9 times a 20 percent bonus we get we get crunchy right it's hard numbers you can do with the calculator but these artifacts very much are very random there's a large variety of them you don't get too many of them think six of them 12 at a time you're never going to have you know huge stockpiles of them you're going to consume them as you go sometimes you're going to save them a couple types are good for when you're being invaded. Other times, you're going to use them to improve your planets as soon as you get them. There's no point in waiting. You're like, this is a plus 20 bonus to this? I want it immediately on my best planet. You're going to just use them up as they come. But it's a very soft, spongy mechanic that just, again, makes the game so enjoyable. I'm so sorry we haven't advanced beyond the first turn yet, you guys. But... There's a, there are a dozen other gameplay series you can watch on Galciv 4 right now, Supernova, if you want to see gameplay. You don't need to be here with me doing this. But if you want to get the breakdowns, understand what's going on, that's what we're doing. Ah, let's jump back into Earth. One more time. Back into Earth. Here we go. So, to get the Nanite Transmitter Upgrade Artifact, to unlock the artifact, we need to go to the Orange Arrow and essentially... It'll create one nano worship charge and it'll cost 60 production. Probably not going to worry about that just yet, but we'll get to it. So all that being said, there's still so much to cover. Let's jump into our first thing. We know that we have one tile that is a population tile. We have a building, our capital city, which will build instantly. That is a population improvement. The reason we want to build that on there is if I look down here, bonus per level, meaning zero level, you can have a zero, you can have a donut, you can have a one, you can have a 23. Your level can get quite high. We will get a gross income of plus 5% for the whole planet for every level. And we will get a population cap of plus one pop on this planet per level. So if we just grab this capital city building, we plop it in the desert, we can do that. It's not a problem. But we won't gain that 5% to income and we won't gain a plus one to our pop cap. Or if we, or if we jump dump it on any other tile, any like a manufacturing tile, that plus one manufacturing will do nothing. We'll get nothing. So... There is no question, based off of all the tiles, we have a single population center. So here we go. We just uh, drag it and, and, and look at this. As soon as I grab the building, I can, I can drop it back in. I grab it. I, it's a floating icon. I can drop it anywhere I want. You'll notice the number one, that black one, just popped up, meaning that it synergizes at a plus one level. So this is a very quick way to grab a building and say, where the F should I put this? Well, you should... You should put it here. So there you go. Because it has zero production cost, it is made immediately. Let's look at some of the sweet, sweet benefits we just got. You remember we had our max pop cap had been a plus three, if you recall. Well, over here, our building gives us a few things. The base effects of the capital city are tourism plus 10%. Cool. Pop cap plus 6%. Or plus six. Awesome. Um... I find it sort of interesting though. We were sitting at a plus three and then a plus six. To me, that equals nine. Oh, oh, wait. It's because of our level. Because this is up here now. Ch uh, check it out. This is the level number. Level up, one. Level one, pop cap, plus one per level. So we started with a natural three for the planet. The... Base effect of the capital city gave us a six, taking us to nine with a plus one level of one to take us to 10. That is how we got this number over here of pop cap 10. Getting crunchy. So this is 
where we'll start looking at a lot of numbers and the better you understand this, the better you can min-max this game and be at it. So for whatever we do here, additional tutorials, we will be getting into this kind of math stuff. So you can see how it all works together. It's really cool. Uh, I enjoy it so damn much. So back to the capital city building. What else we got? Sensor range, plus three. I don't think that's per ship. I think that's the sensor range around the planet. I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not sure if we jump out of the planet and we look at it. Will it have a sensor range? Probably. Let's check. Let's check right now. Sensor range plus three. This damn video can be as long as it needs to be. I don't care. It's a Saturday night, folks. My wife's hanging out with the girlfriends at the bar right now. The, the wine. They're sipping wine till nine. So I'm just going to play. I'm going to play as long as I can tonight. Here we go. We have Earth down here. Let's see. Do we have a sensor range? Mm, population, 7 to 10. Research. Crime. Oh, yeah. Income. Planetary defense. Nice. We'll get into that. Influence? Just looking for something that says sensor range. I want to see where that plus three is getting us. Farming input? No. Manufacturing? No. Control? No. Interesting. I'm looking for something that's got a range to it. The sensor range on the Discovery is 5, but I think it was 5. I think she was a 6 on movement and a 5 on sensor range. You guys can always rewind. But so, interesting. Um, yeah, I. so here's what I believe happens. Listen, at some point, we may send the Discovery off away from Earth. Now, if a Xenos comes creeping up on Earth, it's only going to show up in our view, possibly, when it comes within the sensor range of Earth. And I'm looking here on Earth's tile. So you can see there's two ways to see. Here's here's Earth's tile right here. It's got some information that's not identical to the pop-up tile here. So the, the, yeah, I don't have a problem with that so much, but it is odd. Um, you know, Stardock kind of sorted stuff out in different interesting ways, but eh, let's not sweat it. I think this, I think these tiles are a more generalized tile that you'll find is true for world to world, station to station, ship to ship. Whereas these pop-ups are much more detailed, such as talking about the nanite transmitter artifact being on the world and that it's our civilization capital. Those wouldn't be relevant to other planets. So I think that's why they're not displayed in, in the subtile here. Potentially, or I'm just talking out of my ass. I don't know. Um, let's jump back on here. So, yeah. I don't see where sensor range is for the world. So it's a hidden... It's a hidden variable, I guess. Or, you know, whatever. Cool. Let's jump back into Earth. What else does our capital building do? She's giving us a plus one control per month. That actually tracks. Because if you recall, we started with a plus two control. So I believe what would happen is initially you would have a plus one control as your default as a player. We took bureaucrat plus one and that that bumped us. Yeah, I think we put one pip into bureaucrat. So it gave us a plus one on top of our regular one. Sure. And then um, we have another plus one because of our capital city. Right, right there. Yeah. So that's how we went from two to three. So there you go. Uh, what else we got? Influence plus 100. This is interesting. Influence is an interesting animal. Every one of your planets is going to bank influence and build the number. We'll go from zero to 100 to 200 to 2,000 to 200,000. It just keeps growing and growing as you play the game over years as they go by. The influence will continue to grow. You also have a monthly increase to influence. So, sorry, my chair's a little squeaky. You're going to grow your influence month by month by month by a certain rate. But you can also gain uh, uh, cash out values of influence. So, by making the capital city, we get a one-time, that's what we'll call it, not a cash out, a one-time. A one-time 100 influence bonus to this world, to Earth. And the reason that matters is I believe there are percentage growth multipliers 
So that 100, although we only get it the one time, it may subtly, minorly affect other percentage monthly bonuses that will get recurring. So re recurring return on investment, ROI. There, there you go. So let's check our influence real quick. Down here, we have influence. Boom. So I'm going to hold shift so I can mouse into here. The total in... Oh, you son of a bitch. There we go. <laughs> Total influence uh, is 110. Our capital city gave us the plus 100. And you can see there, it literally pops up the capital city building. So you have multiple ways to get at the capital city numbers. Cool. Um, current influence is plus 10. Influence growth per month is 21.7. That is based off of planetary base just for the Earth. Because we took the certain trait, every one of our colonies gets a plus two. So uh, the planet will give one. The certainty will take that to a plus three. We have a influence plus influential plus one trait that we also took. These were in the civilization traits we selected initially when we were doing all the little, you know, red, yellow, green, blue circles, radio buttons, checking them. 10% bonus. We have our governor... D.L. Bradley, uh, up over here, um, gives us a plus 6.5. We haven't even gotten to leaders yet. Oh my gosh, that's a whole vi hour video to talk about leaders. We'll get there. We have our citizens. All of our little citizens give us little chunks of influence. They're usually decimal values, like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. And so, yeah, we essentially, our, our very people help build the influence of our entire species. Influence is a very compound value. It's it's com compounded of many, many other things. But um, so one governor gives us a big chunk. All five of our citizens give us 1.8. Our scientist gives us 0.4. That's right. A scientist is a citizen, is a pop, but is not considered a citizen. Different jobs. Citizen is a job title. All right. It's a generic job title. So we'll, we'll get to it. Whew. And we have cultural input, plus eight. Where is that coming from? Cultural input is one I have is a nut I have not cracked in this game. I've certainly th seen things that will modify your cultural input, but is it is a very hidden value, and I have not been able to really find out how to access it or locate it. You see, when I mouse over can't adjust it hmm. okay and then natural influence radius is plus five so that's five hexes around the earth that's the diameter of our blue circle is five now influence controls how far your borders spread once borders collide low influence world may culture flip to control of a higher civilization with higher influence so the more influential our planets are in our culture our civilization is we can push up against the xenos border of influence and then push into their bubble so you can imagine two spheres uh how can i rip? here we go two spheres coming together but when they meet they will flatten out and then the more powerful influence will curve in and this one will, will give way so the it, it, you know It'll, it'll circumscribe an arc into the other influence bubble and push and grow further and further into it. And as your influence bubble surrounds Zeno's worlds or stations, you can subsume them. It's pretty sweet. But yeah, that's going to grow. Is the total influence, this top number here, grows into the thousands and tens of thousands, our natural influence radius will grow in some formula. I'm not exactly sure how it works. Um... It'll grow. And month by month, we will gain this influence month. So it this 21.7, next turn, we'll just dump into here and we'll be essentially at um, 137, no, 131.7. Yeah. So, and it'll grow month by month. And it kind of is a snowball effect. It gets big fast. There's all sorts of cool buildings and shit you can do to make that grow. So that was, we're still getting our capital building. We're still there. <laughs> Gross income plus 10. That's just a straight 10 credits. That's nice. That helps us with our tax base. If you 
Notice up here, why is it only... We were at plus two, and we jumped to plus seven. What the hell happened? Shouldn't we have gotten from a plus two plus a plus ten would equal a plus twelve? No. We didn't get that. Why? We'll find out. We'll figure it out. You'll see. Uh, it'll all be explained. What else do we got? What else does our capital building do for us? Uh, cultural points per month plus one. You notice here, this is this kind of generic cultural point per month plus one. This green plus. I see the green plus here. It's the capital city. And under our influence, we have cultural inputs plus eight. Now, cultural input is not culture points however <laughs> culture point per month is this culture point so culture points even though they have a nearly identical symbol is not the same thing as cultural input they just look very similar they look identical stardock help us out come on folks <laughs> put your cultural input green plus with a, a dotted border. So we can look at cultural input and cultural points and know they're related, but they're not the same thing because they're not the same thing. We're gonna, we're gonna jump out of earth real quick because down here in our cultural progression, Welcome to the cultural progression uh, shut up. <laughs> We will gain one cultural point because we are getting a cultural point per month. Our capital city gave, or yeah, our capital city building gave that to us. Or I guess it's the whole city. It's the whole fucking city. But but the cultural input that plus eight does not give us eight culture points. It's invisible. It's a. It, I don't want to fault Stardock too much here. Because clearly what the designers at Starbuck have done is given you a bunch of crunch and a fair amount of sponge. Sponge, like, right? Soft, squishy. They want you to be able to, like, cybermetrics this motherfucker. They want you to be able to min-max this guy. But they also want some of it to be a little squishy, not crunchy, where you don't really know what's going on. I very much feel like that's deliberate on their part. So the cultural points, that's going to start climbing point by point by point each month. Eventually, you might be able to get to plus two points a month or plus three points a month. But that is not your cultural input. So we're going to go back into Earth here. It is, it is, it is not this cultural input of plus eight. I don't know what the difference is. Whatever. We'll figure it out. So is that everything? Is that everything? Yeah, that's pretty much everything with our building. Let's get that gross income, though. We saw that plus ten. But up here, I'm looking, I say, okay, our monthly income is 6.65 credits, credits, galacto credits. I like to call them as a joke, but uh, yeah, credits. So that's our growth. That's our growth though. So check this out here, folks. This is this, this, this is credits up monthly income. That's our surplus. This is what goes into the piggy bank, the $1,500 yeah, piggy bank. It's our bank, literally. So that's what that number represents. Now, they're rounding up courteously, I, I, I guess, to the plus seven. Cool, like free money. I, I don't know. That seems odd, but yeah, sure. So here we got our gross income is 23.94. Our tax rate is 33% of the gross income, folks. Yeah, that's right. So... <laughs> That's that's how we're getting to this number. And then our expenses are sitting at a nice fat whole credit of 1.25. So let's break this down. You're going to take your gross income. You're going to multiply that motherfucker by 33%. If you guys want me to swear less or swear more, let me know. But uh, I played a soccer game today. So I'm like, I'm a little loopy right now because I'm not in very great shape. I'm... I feel great though. Shit, yeah. Like, it's almost surreal. I'm going into, like, the freaking zone right now in my brain because I'm just, like, talking and crunching so much. It's awesome. A game should take you to this place. I'm not high. I'm not stoned. I'm not on anything except a bit of fatigue from a great soccer match. that We, we had a draw. We scored two goals in the final five minutes, including a last 
second penalty kick for a hands ball in the goal box. Direct kick. We score. We tie. Brilliant. I feel great. But I'm tired. I'm sweating right now. It's my body telling me I need to sleep. But I'm going to keep going here. I'm going to make a two-hour video. I don't I don't care. Okay, here we go. Let me know if you like swearing, though. It's so much fun. So, uh, we got 23.94. Essentially, income, taxes is going to hit that first or later. Shit. Ew. Yeah, it's going to hit it later. No, no, it's going to hit it first. This is why. 33% is one third. One third of 24 is eight. So our income from our, our tax base is eight credits. You subtract 1.25 from eight and you end up with right approximately 6.75. In this case, 6.65 because clearly there's a little bit, little bit of a wiggle room. We're, we're down 0.3 of a percent from a full one third 33% is not 33.3 repeating, so it's not a true third, it's a little less. And our gross income is actually 23.94, not 24. That's why this is not 6.75, but instead of 6.65. But just doing a quick brain math, it all pretty much works out. So, can we adjust our tax rate? We'll jump out of here. No, not yet. We have not opened up the civilization tab. We will have it as soon as we advance to turn one which we're not quite ready to do yet. But in there, you can get your tax rate. You can set it to like 15, 25, 30, 50, whatever. And that's going to adjust your approval ratings and stuff. Let's jump back into Earth. We're still going. We're still going. So we understand money a little bit. So look, we've looked at our shipyard. We have looked at our improvements. We've talked about available projects a little bit. We've got our build queue. We've got our hexes. Let's throw something into the, the build queue real quick. Now that we have our capital building, you'll notice that it also provides an adjacency bonus of plus two level to all building types, to all adjacent tiles. So if we want to improve the forest or we want to improve the tundra, the research, either one of these will get good bonuses because they're adjacent to our capital city. Now, we kind of hamstrung ourselves a little bit because we put our capital city population improvement on a population tile but and we did that because of the other shit the shit it gets on the level tier but yeah let's go wait i'm just going to click on this i just left clicked on the forest and you can see over here we can get a plus two to agriculture meaning food we can get a plus two to entertainment and where i'm where i'm seeing that plus two is this this gold number this gold number means we get something two food Two entertainment, two finance, three production, two research. Why is the production better? The production is better because we are going to build production on a forest that gives a plus one to manufacturing. The plus one to manufacturing adds to the plus two adjacency bonus to the capital city, yielding a plus three. But because the capital city provides an adjacency bonus of plus two levels to all, all means any is really what that means. We could build anything here, anything we want, we, we could build. It's pretty sweet. Now, let's do a quick comparison. Let's come down to this uh, kind of crappy planes. I'm gonna click it. Look at this. I can build an agricultural district, an entertainment, finance, manufacturing, or research. I can build the district. It'll cost me the production, but we don't gain any gold numbers. It's not doing anything for us. So what would a research district do on that plain planes well it would cost us 75 production on the construction cost the base effect would be a plus one to maintenance one credit per month forever and we get a four percent bonus to research so it would very in this very small way contribute to our research but we get no level bonus the level would be zero meaning here we get no level so it's a really shitty place to build a research district. We're not going to do it. However, it would yield an adjacency bonus to other tiles of a plus one to research. So in a place like, a, like this little alley here, desert, desert, plains, plains, 
those are kind of crappy places. They're the last places we're going to want to build on planet Earth here. But we could do it. We could build a research district here that would then yield a plus one research to this plains and a plus one research to this desert. So it's not hopeless. It's just not efficient. And this is kind of the f fun tile, hex, hex tile building part of the game. It's how you overlap these in the most efficient ways. But you can always just quickly click on anything. No obligation. It's not going to hurt anything. You can look here. Financial district plus three. That's right, because we have the gold resource here, the gold fields plus three wealth. That's why it's a great place to build a financial district. We could do that right now. So there's so much we can do, but I know that after we finish building the Colonial Leadership Council this turn, we are going to want to build some production sooner rather than later. Because the higher the production is, the higher the manufacturing is, the more this number goes up, and that leads to quicker build times for everything else. So the first thing I want to build on this world is on this forest. I click it, and I'm going to build the manufacturing district. Boom. There you go. We have a build queue. We can swap those things by dragging. We can also click on it, and you can delete it, set it on repeat build, rush the manufacturing, meaning we can spend credits, 875 credits to insta-build that MF. We don't need to do that. We'll have it in two turns. One turn for the leadership council, one turn for the manufacturing district. So it, it's going to build the suckers quick. Um, what else we got? We can load up the queue with a couple other things. What, uh, what else would be worth doing? Let's do, let's hit our research. Yeah, let's uh, build a research building for three. Now you notice the manufacturing, we could put a manufacturing district there also would be three. And you're going, wow, that's interesting. Why, what's the difference? Well, the reason this value has gone up by one on manufacturing for this research tundra tile is because it's looking at the queue order. It's going to go, you're going to build a manufacturing district here. You can see it's, uh, you see this kind of dark grayed out. It means it's coming. And it's saying, oh, well, your capital city will give a plus two to manufacturing on the tundra. And the adjacency bonus of plus one level to manufacturing adjacency bonus from this district makes this tundra tile have a total of plus three to manufacturing. If we go that way, I would probably go. Do we want to do that? We could. We could burn it. We could totally burn it and get an extra manufacturing. Yeah. Be, uh, or we can do research. Check this out. Click on the reef. Yeah, I want that plus three to research. Boom. Oh, wow. Whoa. Well, why did that number change? Oh, man, I'm sweating here. I don't know what just happened. Maybe it was always a 13 and the, the three was just cut off. Let's find out. Listen, we haven't spent anything, so we can just click on the research thing and we'll delete it. We'll hit the X. Delete it. What the fudge? What, what kind of funny business is this? Yeah, that actually makes sense. I wasn't really clear why the production the manufacturing district we were going to get in one turn. So maybe that was never what was actually going to happen. Maybe it was always 13. Let's assume it is. Here's my point. The long, short, skinny of this is you want to build the most efficient tiles up fastest. So would I build this tundra for a plus one to research or would I build this Reef for a plus three to research. Build the fucking reef, folks. Look at the cost. It will cost me 20 turns to build the research district on the tundra, or it'll take me 20 turns to build the research district on the reef. But I get three times the research for building on the reef. So without a doubt, you would build that. Now, Theoretically, you would want to rush around and, and, and build all these suckers up. Like, oh, we, we're going to need more food. Eventually, as our population grows, we only have three surplus food right now. So, yeah, I could be like, yeah. Agriculture district on the forest. Boom. Plus three. Boom. So, I want to go to the choicest tiles first and build those up first. We have another great food tile over here with the giant mushrooms. So, we Earth is going to be kind of a breadbasket world. Quite, quite legitimately. But do we want to go with more production sooner? Possibly, possibly. Um, this tundra 
could become a production instead of a research district. Now, this research on the tundra has increased to four. Why? Because it's saying, oh, you're going to build this sucker. It'll give a plus one research bonus to everything. You guys are getting it. You're getting, getting it? Yeah. Um, it's not a hard science. It's not perfect. I'm going to actually do manufacturing. I'm going to have these two be my manufacturing tiles around my capital city, and they're all going to work together. They're going to reinforce each other and get me more and more production. I don't want to go nuts with it, but yeah, you got to get a certain amount of production early to start with. So it may even be worth jumping this in the queue and slotting these over and going for that production sooner rather than later. Do not sweat it, folks. You can always delete something from the queue with no penalty. Although if, if they've started in on the production, I wouldn't delete it. If, if they've put production into it, I, I don't think you, you could lose it, so I wouldn't delete. I wouldn't delete the active build item in the build queue. I would only delete things that are over here. Also, at any time, you can click on something like this building and destroy an improvement and rebuild over it. So it's not like, not not that I, oh, I want to do that. Here, let me click on something else. Yeah, there we go. I, I want to make sure I don't hit. Um, if we ever later down the road are like, you know what? I don't need as much production. I want this Tundra to become a research thing because the light bulb is better there. You absolutely could trash the manufacturing district you'll, you'll say build in, in a, a couple of years from now in 26 turns from now and uh or, or actually f shit uh 46 turns because 13 plus 13 plus 20 down the road you could delete the manufacturing district rebuild something else so you could scrap stuff rebuild rejigger your stuff we may need food sooner so we may build up food here and food here only to down the road be like, man, we got more food than we know what to do with. Let's cut down on our food. Let's refocus to other stuff. So listen, we built up the build queue. You can keep going on this, but we don't need to go crazy with build queue. Um, I am running out of steam here, folks. I think that's probably going to be it for tonight for this episode. We're going to come back another day with part three of our in-depth tutorial where we will jump right back into planet Earth, and we're going to get over here and do this entire panel. We're going to look at our leader. We're going to look at the status report. We're going to look at the citizens. The citizens, oh my gosh, look at this. Look at that. That's, this, this is just... Van, <laughs> Vasantri Mar has all this information. She also has a job of citizen, and she also has her own approval separate from everyone fucking else ben may has his own stats and his own job and his own approvals that are not the same as vasanti's now little people there are kind of randomly generated so you don't have to like overanalyze each of them but we will take a deep dive we'll get into the planetary inputs and we'll get into the planetary outputs that's gonna be a whole nother hour talk so that's what's going to come up next. We'll get it. We'll cover leaders. We'll cover the rest of that tile there. And we'll hopefully advance to turn turn one. That's it. If you watch, thank you so much. I am loopy with hunger and tiredness right now. Take care, folks.